question of the Roman man, five thirty years ago, after the carbon shoes, right? What? That's some of those carbon shoes? Yeah, I got carbon training shoes, carbon spikes, they got carbon everything you want. They can put carbon in it and arrange you there. It'll be in there somewhere. Oh yeah, they're nice. I figured it again. Yeah, it looks. It's crazy the stuff that's going on with the carbon shoes right now. There's sure been a lot of records going down. It's like so many high school kids are just. Yeah, the high school kids are getting past their college system. You get to. Unless you want to play the shoe to come Earlier specialization? Or? Yeah, I don't know. It's like the third graders are running 40 miles a week now. <laughs> it must be something. I don't, I don't know how it's been played. Like, even this year in our class, it's like the 3,000 is just ridiculous this year. Mm. The crazy jump. I don't know what's going on. I think a lot of it, too, though, is COVID. People really took advantage of that year. Just being able to train and not to worry about racing or just yeah. you know, putting the miles and all those things. There was one kid, I can't remember his name, at Newberry Park. Oh, in high school. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four minutes. Yeah, he just wrote four minutes. Really. Four minutes. I can't remember his first name. His last name's Young. Because he just broke his brother's, all the older brother's high school records. Yeah. There's a, and then his, his brother's at uh, Northern. Yeah. Yeah, his brother will probably be his brother will probably win nationals in the mile. He plays his Leviathan for sure. Actually, he probably won't win nationals in the mile. That'd be sad for his brother. I mean, definitely top five. Yeah. Oh, well, definitely top five. Finish his time there, or he'll go pro. Yeah, yeah I know. I just know a lot of kids. There's a kid from Iowa or from Oregon last year was a freshman. Made it to the Olympics and just went pro instead of finishing out mm-hmm. school. Mm-hmm. I guess it's a money. Yeah, they, 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 it's, it's, it's so weird though now, especially with all the live and life and stuff that you can do. And, like you go to the LMH just as much money almost. Yeah. From that, if you're running for Oregon, I'd be with you for running for the pro athlete. That's, that's different for sure. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, all right. Well, here we are. Uh, quick question. Yes. Yes. Can we talk about some things on target? Yes. Because I, I think like you're in the project on Okay. I'm not sure if I can read it. And I think it's a great time. Kind of, kind of, both people are like, oh, well, I've got to start in there. Sure. Just so I don't forget, I have that topic sheet. Why don't you write that down? So that would be a project. Okay, welcome. How's everybody doing? Good. Okay. All right, so we have uh, today a little bit of chapter six, and then I want uh, to start on some research. And so to get you started, there's a folder and so um, I understand you may have changed your topic at this point uh, but if you still have the same topic that's on the sheet there should be an article uh, here for you I need to fix that I will I will do that sorry about that um, so that should get you started. So that's our second half of the class today is working on research articles. Um, so what I'll ask you to do after we cover a few things from chapter six, and this will <clears throat> also tie into the first exam. So you want to be making sure that you've got journal articles because question number one on the exam is uh, use of these articles that you're finding in class today. So it'll tie in, what we do today will tie into the exam. 
um, member APA format. So this is the most recent edition of the seventh edition of APA format for journal articles. So you'll want to follow uh, this format. And as, as Tyree was telling us last week, um, it's common now to include the DOI at the end of the reference. So, uh, so that's the second half of class today. I'll ask you to find five uh, references and turn those in. And then uh, I would suggest that you use those same references uh, for question number one of the exam. And so the exam will be posted on Tuesday and it will be right here in this folder. It's a take home exam. And uh, you'll have uh, until uh, February 17th via email or hard copy to complete it. So it's all essay. And uh, I encourage you to uh, discuss amongst yourselves the questions and come up with your own answers, though, uh, and then use the articles that you find today uh, as part of the exam. So we'll, we'll be meeting, but uh, we have lots to do with chapter six that we'll do in class. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday next week is when we start on stats. And so you'll need to have Excel available. I'll have an Excel spreadsheet where we'll actually do hands-on type calculations. So again, Sydney, I apologize. I overlooked it. My mistake, I'll help find an article for you. And it should be pretty easy to do. So any questions? Okay, all right, so let's, let's go ahead and get into chapter six. So an introduction to statistics. Good quote here, anything is possible if you don't know what you're talking about. Turn my quote there. All right, so uh, statistics are a way we can express numbers. So an overall message. How do we describe a sample? So in all of your research projects, you'll likely be using a sample of convenience. Uh, a lot of you probably teammates. That's common uh, if you're an athlete and we have, this is rare, we have all athletes in here. So uh, you might be asking teammates to help you with your project, which is really common. So you need to understand that the results that you get are probably most generalizable to the sample. Uh, so that will be addressed in your paper. Uh, statistics are, are methodological and logical. Okay. So what I want to teach you in here is different ways of expressing numbers. What exactly does statistical significance mean? And beyond significance, uh, what are some other ways that we can express numbers to create meaning? So a lot of students will calculate effect sizes. Effect sizes uh, are a measure of the magnitude of effect. From a practical standpoint, how meaningful is the result? Aside from probability, which is what statistics rely on, is probability. So in your paper, you'll describe the characteristics of your sample. Some common things, uh, height, body mass, age are kind of the, the standard. Uh, other things you might consider, uh, training background. So uh, that's important to know for your reader because obviously results could be different if you're working with an untrained versus a trained sample. So that's important. Um, you test the relationships between variables. Um, in place of relationship, think about using the word association or correlation. Correlation, the relationship between two variables. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today. Uh, we can also test differences between groups or conditions. Okay. 
Okay, the mean or the average is an important measure. We call it central tendency, the tendency for the score of a sample to gravitate towards the middle. And so we express the average, um, but we also look at the variability. So you have the mean score or the average, but you also have the variability around the average. So um, you could have a sample that has lots of variability around the average. So the average is the mean, but then the, the variability we express is the standard deviation. Standard deviation. So we say the mean plus or minus the variability, plus or minus the standard deviation. So what is the spread of scores around the mean score? So if you're comparing two samples, and they both have a mean, and they both have a standard deviation, you might have a certain amount of overlap between the standard deviations. So the means might be a good distance apart, but then you could have overlap in how far those scores vary from the mean. And that, that can affect the results of your, your statistical test. So let's talk about relationships to start off with. And Ali, I, I talked a little bit about this in the other class yesterday. Um, so relationships can be expressed with what we call the Pearson R, sometimes called the Pearson product moment correlation. So this is a number on a scale from negative 1.0 to positive 1.0 with zero in the middle. So this is the most common method of looking at the association between variables. So again, Pearson R. And so you have a scale, 1.0 on that end, and negative 1.0 on this end. So Ali, again, we, we heard all this yesterday, so everybody else, this might be new. Um, in the middle is 0, 0.0. So this is the common method of, of looking at the association between two different variables. So on this end, variables will move in the same direction, either up or down. And we call this a proportion. Relationship. So as one variable increases, uh, we tend to see an increase in uh, the other variable. Can you think of any examples where we would have a trend in that type of relationship? So an easy one is Bryant was talking about 5,000 meters. Um, we might say that there's a proportionate relationship between um, VO2 max and running economy. Just, we might say that as VO2 max tends to go up, running economy also goes up. So economy is defined as the, how much energy you're expending to run at a certain speed. So you take two runners and they're both running at a given, at the same speed. The one who expends less energy is more efficient or economical. So we might say that as your aerobic capacity or your VO2 max goes up, uh, we would also see an increase in running economy. It, it may not be perfect, but we say that a strong correlation is greater than 0.7 on this side. Um, another correlation, one that I, that I went ahead and mentioned in the other class yesterday, uh, weightlifting performance and vertical jump height. 
So the two official weightlifting movements are the snatch and the clean and jerk. So those are, that's the sport of Olympic weightlifting, the snatch and the clean and jerk, and then you take the total and, and then they have weight categories and the one who lifts the most in the weight category is, is the winner. Um, there tends to be a positive correlation between how much weight you can lift for the clean and also vertical jump. Okay, so it's not it's not perfect, but they tend to move in in the same direction. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's talk about this end now. For this end, variables will increase or decrease, but in opposite directions. So we call this more of an inverse relationship. So again, example from class yesterday. So we looked at an article that showed that uh, the time for the 30 meter sprint was inversely associated with the ability to do a deep back squat. So what how do we define a deep back squat? Do you remember, Alan? Yesterday, how to define? Should I remind everybody? Um, so a deep back squat is defined as where the crease of the hip is below the top of the knee joint in the bottom position. So uh, for the sport of powerlifting, um, a good lift, uh, one that would be counted, would be where the crease of the hip is below uh, the top of the knee joint at the bottom position is considered a deep squat. So there was an inverse relationship between someone's ability to do a deep back squat and their time in the 30 meter sprint. So as the amount of weight they lifted in the deep back squat went up, their time in the 30 meter sprint went down. In other words, they were running faster. So that's important. So, so we have in health and human performance, we have relationships that are proportionate, and we also have relationships that are that are inverse. So we would say that a that a strong inverse relationship would be uh, in this direction greater than zero uh, negative zero point seven would be the, a strong, and the study that we were looking at in the other class yesterday uh, showed that there were several correlations with 30 meter sprint performance and deep back squat that were above 0.7, so getting closer to 0.8. So it's a, that's a very strong uh, indicator that possibly uh, sprint performance could be positively affected by doing a deep uh, back squat. So range of motion is really important um, in terms of transferring to good sprint performance. Um, so that's just an example. Uh, let's, let's take a look here at some other examples. So, as the correlation gets closer to zero, then we would say that there's not much of a relationship, no relationship present between the variables. Um, so let's take a couple of extreme examples in the world of sports, especially sports that require a very high fitness component. So everybody, knows who this guy is, right? So he's the world record holder in the marathon. Um, he's also the first man to break two hours in the marathon. Um, one minute, 59 seconds, uh, one hour, 59 minutes and 43 seconds. Um, that world record that you see a picture of here was done with under very controlled conditions with pacers that you can see behind him there. Um, so the official world record that was done in a, in a sanctioned event is, is his as well, 201.39. Uh, 
you can also see that he has very impressive times, uh, elite times going all the way down to the mile at three minutes and uh, 50 seconds. So I would say uh, arguably the greatest distance runner of all time for, for males. Um, okay, on the other side of it, we have arguably one of the strongest humans of all time, uh, Bill Kazmaier. So his winning lifts were 925 pounds in the squat, uh, 661 pounds for a bench press, um, 837, almost 838 pounds for a deadlift. Um, so just a little more detail. Um, the bench press and deadlift were done raw. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's just like you're dressed now. <laughs> so t-shirt and shorts, he did that. Uh, well, the squat was performed with wraps, which add some spring, especially out at the bottom, and a marathon squat suit. So a, a squat suit is something that also gives your muscles a little more spring and power. Okay, so we're talking about elite endurance and elite strength. This is interesting because looking at this picture, this really summarizes exercise science in a nutshell. We have one side of the metabolic continuum that is high intensity, short duration, and we have another side of the metabolic continuum that is long, uh, low, relatively lower intensity and long duration. Okay. So my question to you is, can you have one individual that can have elite strength and elite endurance at the same time? Can you have someone that can run a five minute mile and also deadlift 500 pounds? Yes. Most likely not. I mean, it'd be tough. I think it'd be doable. Yeah. It'd be doable. I'd probably have to have this have this for another week and try to make it, you know, not count. Maybe. Especially if I had all of my cardio that I normally do every time I lift. Yeah. That's true. So I would, I would, I would definitely agree. It would be tough. So if you can find, that'd be an incredible human being that can take this and this and put it together. Someone that can deadlift, we'll say 500 pounds. That's kind of a, a milestone in deadlift performance, 500 pounds, and then also run a five minute mile. That would be something. I'm thinking of a few individuals that I'm, with training, could maybe, yeah. Um, it'd be careful training. I think it'd be easier to take a person that could run a five minute mile and keep them there and train them to deadlift while also maintaining their endurance. Which would be tough. So, Generally, what we see, at least at the, at the elite level, is a, a very low correlation between endurance performance and strength performance in the same individual, because it's hard to put those two qualities together at the same time. Can you think of any sports where you kind of have to have some of both? You have to have good anaerobic fitness and good aerobic fitness at the same time. Soccer. Exactly. Yeah, you do. You have to have a great VO2 max, but you also have to be good at sprinting. Rugby. Yes, yeah. Another one, you have to be able to go the full duration, but um, it's obviously a contact sport that requires a lot of strength and force. I'm thinking of you. Basketball, Basketball yeah. You, you've got to have both qualities. So that's tricky. With <clears throat> And then you have athletes that either are specializing in one or the other based on the requirements of their sport. But that's, that's, that'd be an interesting experiment is, that, that I think it would be tougher to take someone that could deadlift 500 pounds already and turn them into a five minute miler. I'd rather go this way and take someone that could already do the five minute mile because that's really hard to do. And it would seem to me you could 
build up their strength over time to where they could be both. But that's tough. So that's just to illustrate why we have different fitness characteristics. Because if two fitness characteristics were measuring the same physical qualities, why would we need two? Because they wouldn't be different. So when we look at measures of fitness qualities, cardiovascular endurance, muscular endurance, maximal strength, okay, flexibility, all of these things, they're independent qualities. So we develop those qualities uh, independently. Okay, so this graph represents the relationship between standing long jump and a person's physical height, so stature. And so what we can see is they're kind of a weak correlation. Um, we're talking about proportional, so it's, it's positive, but it's not, not the strongest proportionate relationship. So you can kind of see this shotgun pattern. Each of these dots represents a person. So you take that person's height and then you take their, their height and then their long jump performance and you put a dot. So we can see that to a certain degree, it's headed from the lower left to the upper right, but it's kind of scattered. It's really not like along a straight line. So a straight line would be a perfect 1.0 correlation. This is more kind of a weak correlation. So I'll give you another example. This is the unofficial world record in standing broad jump. So set in 2015 at the NFL Combine. Um, so this person uh, jumped 12 feet 3 inches. So you think about this is an, his actual jump, a still frame in, in midair. And what he's going to do is throw his legs forward and then complete the jump. I think the author is missing something. I mean, the author could be in fact as well. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, he does have a lot of energy. Yeah, yeah, he does. I'll bet he's, he's fast. Usually people that can jump really far can also jump really high. So it turns out his vertical jump was also really high. So... 44 and a half inches as well. So he was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. Not sure if he's still playing or not, um, but impressive nonetheless, he still holds that world record. So what kind of correlation would you expect if you took a sample of say college basketball players and looked at their standing broad jump with their standing vertical jump? Which, which side of the Correlation would be on inverse or proportional. Yeah, proportional. So you'd you'd expect that to a degree, maybe not a perfect correlation, but to a degree, a degree as one goes up, the other probably goes up. How many of you have ever watched Braden Anderson on our on our track team? He's a guy that I've never had the privilege of measuring his vertical but I've seen his standing broad jump. And I would assume that based on his standing broad jump, which is somewhere around 10 feet, that he could probably also jump high as well. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about um, something else, kind of timely. Uh, how many of you have been following preparations for the NFL Combine taking place in a little less than a month? Um, <clears throat> So over the years, um, especially in the last 15 years, there's been a lot of research on the NFL Combine. So what, what types of tests are they doing at the NFL Combine? Yeah, 40 is kind of the showcase event. That one's always the one that shows up on ESPN. What else? Mm -hmm. Broad jump, vertical jump. What else? Bench press for reps. Okay, what else? Yeah, agility. So the 20-yard the shuttle, sometimes called the 5-10-5 shuttle, uh, T-agility shuttle, um, 
do they ever, do they take a written exam? Yeah, like a, yeah, yeah, they do. So, um, which has recently changed. It, it, this study was back when they did the old one, but I, it's changed a little bit since then. So, uh, this was a study that looked at quarterbacks, wide receivers, and running backs. It looked at their combine performance and then followed them for the first three years. First three years of their NFL career. And guess what the average NFL career is? Three About three years. Okay. So um, <clears throat> what I'd like you to do is take out a sheet of paper. And I would like you to look at this article posted on D2L. So it'll be a five five point participation assignment. So the NFL Combine does it predict performance in the National Football League? This was done at the this was actually in the, a study through the College of Business at the University of Louisville. And so your questions are as follows. Uh, you're going to look at a table for quarterbacks, and that's going to be table two. And then you'll look at a table for wide receivers, which is table three. And then table four is uh, for running backs. So take a moment. And then the question at the bottom All, not all of these correlations would be in the expected direction. Not everything in the expected direction. So if you were to hypothesize, let's say, um, let's look at number four. For wide receivers, what would you guess the correlation would be between 40-yard dash and year three salary? So would it be proportional or inverse? Think of what proportional and inverse means. What would you guess? It'd be inverse. So in other words, as they ran faster, in other words, so a faster time in the 40-yard dash, um, would you would guess what for year three salary? Yeah, they expect the salary to go up for a faster athlete, right? So inverse, you're right. But let's see if that's how it actually turned out. So go ahead, I'll turn you loose for just a minute to collect those. Maybe put an asterisk by the ones that are not in the expected direction. How do you think uh, Tom Brady did at the NFL Combine? Not good. No, not good. 
So there's going to be more to being a great football player than just what you do at the combine, which might have something to do with the correlations. So we will be making a correlation table like you see here. That's one of the things that we're, we will be doing next week is making a, a correlation table, hopefully some data. Okay. All right. So what did you find for quarterbacks? Vertical jump, broad jump with draft order. So what you get? Vertical jump. Was it inverse or proportionate? Inverse. inverse. So I, I, what I saw was negative 0.36. Where do you get that? So what does that indicate? That with a higher vertical jump, they were drafted sooner, right? So that, that would make sense. Uh, what about broad jump? Kind of the same. Pretty close, negative 0.32. Not a super strong correlation, but it's kind of in the middle between strong and zero. So there's a there's a weak association there. Uh, for quarterbacks, what was the correlation between 40 yard dash and year one QB rating? I didn't look into it, into the factors that go into a QB rating, but I guess it's an overall measure of effectiveness, I would assume. So correlation between 40 yard dash and year one QB rating. Yeah, I got 0.28. So would that be in the expected or unexpected direction? That's kind of a Tom Brady correlation, isn't it? <laughs> in other words, at least for this sample, the correlation showed that slower times in the 40 yard dash were associated with a higher uh, QB rating. In other words, if it took longer, if your time was slower, it took longer to run the 40, you had a higher QB rating. So that's, a, that's unexpected. Okay, So for this sample, that, that would be different than what we would predict. Uh, wide receivers, correlation between the Wonderlick, which they don't use anymore, 50 question test they used to use, uh, in year two salary. What'd you get for that one? Negative 0.26. Expected, unexpected? <laughs> yeah, so a lower score in the Wonder Lick would mean what? Higher salary. <laughs> so that's unexpected. Okay, moving on. Uh, for wide receivers, what was the correlation between 40 yard dash and year three salary? What'd you, what y'all get? Yeah, so expected, unexpected. It's unexpected again, right? So a slower 40 would be a higher year three salary. So can you see it's, with, with people and with different samples, we don't always get 
exactly what we would predict, which is why research is so interesting because sometimes when you're dealing with people, it's, it's different. Um, so in other words, being a great quarterback or a great wide receiver isn't completely dependent on some of these physical qualities they assess at the combine. Um, okay, question five. Uh, running backs, what was the correlation between 40-yard dash and year one yards per carry? That's a good one. Yeah, so that would, would that be expected, unexpected? Yeah. So that says that in, in this case, for the sample they used, the faster players um, had more yards per carry. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay, question six. For running backs, what was the correlation between 20-yard shuttle and year two salary? What'd you get for that one? AZ, what'd you get for that one? Yes, expected or unexpected? That makes sense, right? So, um, a faster time in the 20 yard shuttle would be associated with a higher uh, year two salary. So, some things expected, some things unexpected. We can take from that that there's a lot that goes into making a great football player. Um, so, the combine is just one aspect to consider. Okay. So now we're getting into statistical tests. So most of you will either be doing correlations or you'll be doing a t-test. So a t-test is a very simple way to compare groups or conditions. So the first type of t-test is called an independent t-test. Independent t-test means separate groups or separate conditions. So let's say you were doing the popular topic in, in at MSUB is the post-activation and potentiation phenomenon, which is great. So we've, we've looked at lots of different aspects of that. So you have a population and let's say you pull two groups. So random assignment. So people are randomly assigned to either one group or the other. So um, we actually have a, a thesis student right now that's going to be doing this. One group uh, does jump rope, and the other group does box jumps. So it's, it's different people in each group that you're pulling from the same population and then randomly assigning to jump rope or box jumps as they're uh, conditioning activity. So his design goes something like this. So he has, you know, his uh, population and he's pulling 20 people from that population, 10 people are the jump ropers, and 10 people are the box jumpers. Okay, so he's got 10 people randomly assigned to each group. Now, the assumption is that everybody in the population is equal in characteristics that would affect the dependent variable. So he's putting these two groups through the same protocol. So we'll say dynamic warm up. So I'll just say DW, dynamic warm up. And then we have a baseline, counter movement, vertical jump. Then we have rest period, and then we have our post. Oh. Let's see. Okay, so we have our treatment.
treatment. And then a rest period. And then a post jump. So the treatment would be doing that or doing that. So we could say our treatment is jump rope, JR, or box jump. So in this case, what we're comparing would be two different groups for the, the difference in jump performance. So we're taking the difference between this and this, and so our dependent variable, dv, our dependent variable is the change in jump height. So looking at this, this taking the difference that's the change in jump height and that's our dependent variable so looking at how jump rope versus box jumps affects the change in jump height so because it's two independent groups we're going to be using a an independent t-test would be the, the proper approach sometimes um, sometimes we might take the same group, so we would say the same sample, so the same group of people, and give them two different conditions. So condition one, and condition two. So you understand the difference between the first approach and the second? It's the first approach was two groups of different people. This approach would be one group of the same people. They might do condition one on one day and then they would do condition two on a different day understand the difference with that so if it's the same people that are doing both conditions on separate days that would still be an independent t-test because it's different conditions different treatments so okay so that's an independent t-test So what if you're someone that has more than two groups or more than two conditions? So what if it's what if it's three, three groups or three conditions? Um, in that case, we can do what's called an ANOVA. ANOVA. So an ANOVA is just a special case of independent t-tests where you have more than two. So say uh, in, our, in our example, jump rope, box jump, and then a control. So a control wouldn't receive the treatment. They would just be doing the baseline jumps and the post jumps. So a control and then two treatments, that's three, so then you would be, would be doing an ANOVA. So you'll need to have Excel because we'll, we're going to actually, I'm going to teach you how to do both of them both of these tests. So we'll get a lot of hands-on uh, learning. Okay, so the other type of t-test is a dependent t-test. So a dependent t-test is different in that you're looking at one sample of people in one session. One sample of people in one session. So this would be more of a pre-post type of design. So one, one group of people that is tested twice uh, within the same session. So a lot of our, our post-activation potentiation experiments, if it involves just one condition, um, for example, uh, last fall had one of our baseball athletes uh, test 
medicine ball throws on bat swing velocity. And so he did what's called a pre-post design. So everyone came in one time, which is really easy. I would encourage you to make it simple. One time, they did all of, they did their warm up, and then they did a, their pre-test. So they swung, he was pitching, and they, they swung with the sensor on the bat, and they got their bat swing velocity. And then he had them do the, the medicine ball throws and had them come back and do their post-test. So it's the same people that he's looking at for the post-test and had them do their bat swing velocity. And so you're just comparing pre and post uh, in one session with, with one condition. Um, same thing, had another volleyball athlete that did um, uh, whole body vibration on serve velocity. So warm up and then did the pre-service, uh, uh, measured the velocity, then had them do some whole body vibration and then did their post uh, service. So you're just comparing the pre and the post values in, in one session. So is, is everybody clear on, on what an independent means versus ANOVA versus dependent? So during this discussion, I want you to be thinking about maybe which test which test will your research project use? Will you be using correlations, which is fine, or will you be going into uh, one of these statistical tests? Okay, so any questions? Okay, so uh, for next week, we're going to be doing several examples of correlations as well as, as all of these. So when you get to your thesis, I want you to be sharp and be able to know exactly what to do, how to put your data into a spreadsheet so that you can run these tests. Okay, so for the balance of time today, um, I want to get you started on your, on your literature uh, search. So your assignment for today um, I want to see five references. Okay, you can look at the reference list of the article that I that I posted for you, um, and then I want it in APA format. And I promise this is going to help you uh, with the exam because question number one, you get right into your research search. So I'll be walking around and just to help you with searching things with Sydney. I'm going to go right in. And with some things. So if you want to put your uh, references like in a Word document and then just email that to me, that would be great. Seventh, yeah. 